welcome to Learn to Live Stress-Free. This is Christine Wright with Dr. Robert Wright, Jr., your go-to wellness coaches of www.stressfreenow.info. Our featured guest today is Dr. Derry Ronis, speaking on the power of mediation to resolve conflicts, reduce stress, and engender healing states. Dr. Derry Ronis has been conducting innovative seminars and workshops for over two decades to schools, corporations, government agencies, and religious organizations. She holds a Ph.D. in the field of international peace studies and conflict resolution and provides training in healing racism, gender issues, and any subject pertaining to conflict. Her pioneering work has led to transformation in mediation in education, families and corporations, and in domestic violence prevention. Through her talks, tapes, and books, Dr. Ronis has afforded many people the practical tools for choosing to create positive change and healthy relationships in their everyday lives. She has had careers as an adjunct university professor, a United States Postal Redress Mediator, a Florida State Certified Family and County Mediator, an author, lecturer, and private practice in counseling and corporate mediation. In addition, she was a visiting Rotary Scholar Professor in Belize at Glenn University. Dr. Derry's area of expertise include alternative dispute resolution, conflict resolution, development, education, organizational development, and peace building. She continues to be involved in advocacy, program design, training, and intervention. Derry, welcome. Hello, well, audience. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yes, welcome, uh, Derry, and welcome to our listeners. Derry, what led you to the work that you are currently doing? You know, whenever I'm asked this question, it's a long story, but I'll make it very short. I think that we really can't um, know for sure um, the work that we will be involved in one day that really fits our passion. And I could say that I was a late learner in life uh, as far as knowing my true path, uh, but they all led to the same and it's a kind of a global, think global, act local. And you might say it started when I was 18 years old, and um, I graduated high school. And instead of going to the Woodstock Conference or Woodstock Concert, <laughs> which was a conference of sorts, I was uh, going to Israel and going to live and work on a work farm on a kibbutz with other people from all over the world. And that experience changed my life. Incredible. That's so exciting. Derry, can you describe the mediation process for our audience? Is it just for individuals or can it be applied across the board? It can be applied across the board. As a matter of fact, if you look at what we call ADR or alternative dispute resolution, mediation is completely different from any other form of alternative dispute resolution. In other words, a mediator does not have to be an attorney. A mediator is someone who takes a minimum of a 40-hour course, although now there are other requirements and there are actually degree programs in conflict resolution. Um, When I was starting my studies back in the 80s, you might say the wonderful thing about the union where I did my educational doctoral research was allowing myself to uh, pursue a field that was rather nascent at the time. To answer your question specifically, a mediator is a neutral third-party observer that facilitates a dialogue between two or more disputing parties to help them come up with their own answers to resolving a conflict. It teaches people the skills of listening, of uh, making healthy decisions, of not having to go to someone else necessarily, but allowing a dialogue to ensue. So whether it's done in a postal mediation, in a corporate boardroom with 40 people, who are angry about an issue of a director that self-elected themselves into a position of power, or it's between a couple that can't get along, Uh, mediation is done in many different settings. As a matter of fact, we also have school-based mediation programs, which teaches students from elementary all the way through university level about appropriate behavior and anti-bullying, respect, dignity, kindness, and compassion for other people. 
Whoa, that's, that's a long that, answer. <laughs> that's that's a great answer, though. That definitely qualifies as across the board. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, so that uh, people from a wide range can really take advantage of this process. Jerry, you have such a wide and, and deep background and an amazing skill set with credentials ranging from pastoral counseling to mediation to hypnology. When you work with domestic violence clients, could you describe how you use your multiple skill sets to resolve volatile and potentially dangerous or violent situations? Well, I really appreciate the question, and I wish there was an easy answer, but I will give it to you this way. Um, What I have discovered in my three decades now, I guess I'm getting older in this work, and I, I hate to say it, I mean, I'm really becoming a cynic because, you know, we were doing domestic violence work back in the early 90s in Delray Beach, Florida, in a program called LEAD, Learning Effective Alternatives to Violent Emotions. When I went through my uh, Rotary International Scholarship to teach at Galen University in Belize, they don't even have domestic violence laws there. Domestic violence laws in the Bahamas, where I lived for five years, were just coming about. And even though we have laws in the United States, unfortunately, the statistics are still rising. So it's like you have a whole other generation coming in that hasn't, learned how to resolve skills without anger and emotional, verbal, psychological, and physical abuse. So uh, the rules actually in the state of Florida for mediating um, uh, people who are in conflict because of domestic violence are actually very strict. And where there has been uh, charges pressed for physical violence, physical abuse, those cases really are not necessarily mediatable because usually there is a mental illness that goes along. It's called a dual diagnosis, in which case that would really not be appropriate. Um, if this has to be done with people who are mentally sound, so to speak, as well as are willing to be cooperative and not adversarial. So in domestic violence work, um, I would say that when I worked at a shelter in Delray Beach, Years ago, starting out with children who grew up in environments like that, whether ages 5 to 12 or 18, mostly I would start them off with being able to get rid of their anger in healthy ways, and that might be screaming, raging, yelling in a safe space, uh, you know, pounding a a pillow uh, with their frustration. And then after that, we'd get into a group and start talking about what was going on and how they might be able to handle that conflict based upon what they were experiencing. So it's a it's a very tricky question because you're talking about multi generations. I can see that. Thank you for that answer. So listening to the information that you gave, this is really something that you want to avoid or intervene early on in any type of conflict within a family dynamic. Absolutely, yes. I mean, we have prevention. You know, when we do family mediation, uh, this might be at a point before it's divorce mediation where the couple has definitely decided that, you know, irreconcilable differences, they don't want to stay together, and then they go forward in a divorce mediation, meaning that they're not going to be adversarial, they're going to try to work together to come up with the best solution if they have children, uh, as well as what the courts order or mandated by the state of Florida for child support, that whoever makes the most amount of money contributes more to the children's welfare. Uh, But then, of course, you have the family mediation where you could have a couple in dispute thinking about separating or getting divorced, and when they come in and take a look at some of the other issues that are going on, they decide to maybe work harder at their marriage. Thank you. That's really incredible work that you do. Derry, can you tell our audience about how you learn to handle the stressors in your own life? I mean, <laughs> dealing with this on a day-to-day. Thank you. Thank you. No, <laughs> what, absolutely. What you, share you know, that you learned over the years for yourself or other people who are therapists or coaches or counselors in the healing profession, when you take all this in, you really have to take care of yourself. How did you Absolutely, manage? 100%. That's why they say, physician, heal thyself, even though I'm not a medical doctor. So the point is this. Basically... We learn, when I say we, human beings learn through experience what they can handle and what they can't handle. And I'll give you a perfect example that will succinctly answer that question, that I did domestic violence work with the LEAVE program, Learning Effective Alternatives to Violent Emotions, 
for about eight and a half years, and it was getting to the point where I was getting physical symptoms after doing eight groups a week. And even though I had a partner, it was just not well for my physical well-being. And I told them that I felt bad, but that I needed to end this line of work because it was not helping me. So that would be, you know, honoring my body and not the paycheck and uh, allowing myself to use my gifts in other ways. Now, the other answer to that is that there's always an old saying, when the student's ready, the teacher appears. So I have had many different modalities in my life that have really helped me handle the stress um, of working with other people or watching the 6 o'clock news. And some of those things have been um, yoga, certainly, uh, not just any meditation, but in the last five years, a form of mindfulness meditation, which was started by Dr. John Kabat-Zinn up in Boston at a hospital in a clinic where people were undergoing medical tests for stress-related illnesses and teaching them how to be mindful with their breathing. It's a whole course. There's many books written on it, but it's this idea of staying in the present moment, not living in the future, not living in the past. That is done through the breathing and through being mindful of where we are so we don't misplace our car keys, miss our exit when we're driving, or forgot where we parked the car in the parking lot. And that's just some of the things that have been, you know, really helpful to me, as well as physical exercise, Um, You know, they say that getting rid of the stress in the body, going for a bike ride, a walk. uh, Personally, for me, I've been lifting weights for years. I used to study dancing, modern dance, and so I still take a a dance class once a week in Kai called that. And, you know, this relieves stress. It adds joy to one's life amidst all the conflict that goes on. Derry, you know, I've been listening in, and a couple of things that really struck me here. The first was that you as a healer, therapist, uh, helper, were, uh, it sounded like after uh, so many years of helping other people, you were on the verge or very close to experiencing uh, what's known as stress burnout. And, Absolutely. And, you know, that's something that unfortunately is little talked about <laughs> in the therapeutic community, but I think it's something that needs to be talked about more in terms of people uh, looking at their own self-care, the, the simple uh, mantra, you know, put your own oxygen mask on first before assisting others. And it, it sounded like that's what you needed to do. You needed to have a, a shift in terms of for your own healthy well-being. So that's exactly. the first thing. Yeah. And the other thing that has really struck me in the conversation so far with Christine is that, This issue of, I know we're talking about domestic violence here, but this issue of bullying, because it sounds to me as if there's some component in the domestic violence that would obviously involve bullying, that we've been doing a series of podcasts and the issue of bullying keeps coming up. It's very interesting that it it appears to be a much huger or much larger object looming in interpersonal relationships between uh, people. Have you found that to be the case? A hundred percent correct. As a matter of fact, if we look back historically uh, through history, you see uh, every culture or every civilization that has plundered and pillaged other cultures, including starting out right here with Native American Indians, has been about bullying. You know, we have more we're going to kill you, we're going to take your goods. Uh, Any wars uh, is a very extreme form of bullying. But when you look at what's going on across schools, uh, college campuses, the whole idea of having a victim and the whole idea of having allies or friends so that, you know, I think it was Gandhi who said, um, a leader is no more powerful than the people who give them position to be in a position of power. So if you deface the enemy so to speak there's a saying in the art of aikido actually in a book by dr thomas crumb where in aikido in the martial art you try to not hurt the other person who is your opponent but you move with them in such a way that you get them in a stance so you're both looking out at the same view together and what we find is that hurt people hurt people so whether uh, something as simple in a postal mediation, which is usually about 
people who uh, don't like the way their supervisors speak to them or feel that they're being marginalized or picked on or the same way with students and teachers or students to students or parents um, or even in the office place, the way people have you know, gotten away with bullying for years before sexual harassment laws came into place, then you find that people were bullied or allowed themselves to be bullied because they didn't know they had alternatives. They didn't know that they could ask for help. They didn't know that they could file an ADA complaint or another kind of complaint, an EEO complaint, because people have rights now. And so it's the same way with renters who don't own their own homes and landlords, and they have tenant action associations. You know, when you really stop and think about what I've called for the last two decades, creating a culture of peace, you're talking about people who are enlightened, people who want to treat other people with dignity, kindness, and respect, and not everybody knows that. And, you know, I'm teaching a course now on conflict resolution at Sarasota Technical College, and one of the things that came up this morning was using the idea as simple of the game of playing a tug of war. So the tug of war is what? Two teams are both pulling at opposite ends of the rope with the, with the goal that one team's going to fall down and the other team's going to win. Well, in the idea of conflict resolution... You don't have to play a tug of war. You simply don't have to engage. But you do so respectfully by letting the other people know, I'm not going to engage in an argument with you. I will engage in a discussion with you when you can lower your voice and treat me kindly. And if you can't, then I guess we won't have this discussion. Because this is about people having boundaries. And many people grew up in families where there were no boundaries or, you know, whatever, whatever was acceptable was okay. So that's well, the know, short uh, answer to your question. Derry, this is so interesting. I just want to uh, say this, that listening to you, what I was amazed at, you used the same exact language that two people that we've done podcasts mm-hmm. with use. So this Absolutely. tells me we're on point. And those words were hurt people, hurt other people. Absolutely. They, that's what they said. The hurt people who are hurt, the bull, pe- often people who are, um, become bullies, they were bullied themselves. Exactly. And so I think we will hopefully we will have another podcast that we, where we can have that discussion. <laughs> um, let me ask you this question. Derry, since the prevalence and statistics for domestic violence are so alarming, based on your experience, what are the underlying causes of domestic violence and or bullying? And um, what do you think, uh, in your opinion, could be going on in the mind of a person who is physically or emotionally abusive to their partner and or family members? Okay, so when, when I did the LEAVE program, we called it PDC, but it's still true, Power, Domination, and Control. The idea that someone has to be in control of another human being or thinks that they have to be because they lack self-control. The idea that they have to dominate someone, especially who might suffer from low self-esteem. And the idea of dominating a situation. Let's say that someone works at a job where they feel they're not appreciated and so they come home and they take that out on their partner because their partner allows it. I think culturally we also have to speak to that, Bob, um, in terms of certain cultures where men are taught to be machismo and, you know, if they don't scream and yell and it's my well, my way or the highway, you know, and some people actually do accept that. Um, and then if you take a look at uh, certain religious Uh, dictates that were brought upon by people about what's acceptable and not acceptable. I mean, even going back, you know, less than 100 years ago in the Catholic Church, uh, I don't know how many of our listeners have uh, ever read or seen the movie Angela's Ashes, which was a true story about Dr. Frank McCourt, who recently, well, he died quite a few years ago, but he also wrote a book called Teacher Man, and he was brought up in Ireland, and it was about his father being an alcoholic and the Catholic Church telling his mother, you know, not to leave the husband, keep the family together at all costs, and she would have to go and beg for food from the church and for clothing to feed her children. So that's not an easy answer. You know, it was also legally sanctioned, biblically for a man to beat his wa- his wife with a switch no bigger than the width of his thumb you know and so that went on for years as well so you know when you talk about we're living in 2015 where you would think humans have actually made some progress but we have a lot of neanderthal like consciousness going on okay i think that's a pretty broad uh, you covered a lot of ground <laughs> there Derry. 
since this is such a wide and deep issue, can you give our listeners some examples of practical steps a person who is experiencing uh, domestic violence or being bullied, bullied that they can take to implement to be safe, um, where does mediation come into the picture at all, if any, you know, especially in a drop job situation? Well, most corporations now have human resource departments which are trained in this, and so they either send a person out for EAP, Employee Assistance Program, which might include as well uh, getting counseling for X amount of sessions, or they might actually have an in-house mediation team, which helps people resolve their conflicts if it's possible. You know, the other part that we have to bring in here, which is what I called earlier dual diagnosis, uh, if there is a mental illness in a person who may suffer from explosive anger disorder or uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or drug addiction or alcohol addiction, there's many underlying issues of what causes people to go off in their behavior. So consequently, usually EAP, Employee Assistance Programs, at work. At school, you have the Guidance Counseling Department, and many schools now are creating peer mediation programs where students can be referred prevention-wise, not after it gets really bad, but before when they notice it, to have students go and have students with their own age level helping to see if they could mediate a conflict, which means talk about it. And usually what they find is that, let's say in schools, is that the student that's seeking the most attention via bullying has a lot of personal problems going on in their life, whether with an absentee father or mother or who knows what they're facing in their family of origin. So it's never just a simple answer. And, you know, there are groups now. There are many free programs in every county. Uh, I know, at least in Florida, I think if you call 211, that's a free crisis line information resource help and referral. Also, the police department really has a lot of referrals as well. So it's important that people know where they can go to get help. Yes, Derry, you mentioned something that I observed when I was in the classroom that people are not always aware, I mean, most teachers are, that children are under a certain amount of stress in their home of origin or can be. Absolutely. You know, something may have happened at home last night or this morning, and it may not necessarily be a violent issue, something that the child is dealing with. And especially young children are not able to process uh, their emotions And they come to school with an underlying uh, feeling, and somehow that's acted out in the day or that's triggered by some interaction with another child. So that can easily escalate into a problem when no malicious intent was meant, but that child is coming in in an excitable state. Absolutely. And a lot of people who are not trained to see that don't understand what they're looking at or looking for. Great. I Very agree. I agree. Very true. And that's Very, why a lot of the training now, you know, this is a whole other subject, but teachers are getting very, very burnt out because, you know, they're not, the art of teaching is lost in keeping up with test scores and computer-based scores, and it's not what it used to be. And I think, uh, at least in the colleges and the universities where, where people are actually going for training now to be teachers, they're actually teaching courses in this now about how to refer students who need help. And, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate. I mean, I'll just give you an example. Uh, less than a month ago, we were doing a training with students at New College at a high school here. I'm not going to mention the name of the high school. It's a very excellent public uh, high school. It's one of the only ones that has a program for unwed mothers or mothers with babies who, you know, may or may not be married at a high school level. And um, in that one day that I was there, they had three Baker Acts going on, three calls for the police department for students who were, you know, uh, threatening suicide. And this is a normal occurrence. So it, it, what does it tell you, you know, about the stress the kids are living with? And it's a, it's a sad fact. But when I, when I go into classrooms or when I do seminars or workshops, with groups of kids, any age, middle school, elementary, high school, many of them know people who have either committed suicide, attempted suicide, have been exposed to drugs or alcohol through addiction in their family members. And, you know, this is a big, big problem. 
Yeah, Derry, thank you for that. Just a couple of things quickly. We're going to have to have you come back to do a series of podcasts because every other sentence you mentioned is such a big issue. And here was an example. You mentioned the, um, you know, the uh, the person who can literally fly off the handle, the you know, the explosive rage um, disorder. And what I was, what it made me think of was, um, you know, when you turn on the TV, you see so many incidents of road rage. Where, um, in fact, I, I saw a story uh, uh, two days ago, looking at the New York newspaper, they were showing um, right in front of the Empire State Building in Manhattan, two express bus drivers um, got into a road rage incident, and and they had passengers on their bus. And so, you know, of course, I made the news. But let, let me ask you this question. Um, in a recent blog post, you wrote that mediation is a way to solve disputes anywhere as long as you have willing people. So that right. begs the question, does that mean that there may be no hope or role for mediation unless or until the parties become, quote, unquote, willing? Okay, so here's the here's the. Um dysfunctional part of the answer. <laughs> um, okay. okay, mediation originally started out where it was supposed to be 100% totally voluntary, where people could, you know, say, yes, this is what I want to do, this is a different way of doing it. What happened was uh, about 25, 30 years ago, I guess, when the divorce docket started backing up in the courthouses, they made it mand- mandatory. So the now in instead of it being free will, at least for divorce mediation, it's mandatory that a couple go in front of a court-appointed mediator. A lot of time it's pro se or free, and they see if they can work their differences out that way. They sometimes go with their attorneys, and then, of course, there are private mediators. But that's just a family-based mediation. Um, so the, the whole idea is that the more people know that mediation exists, you know, I remember when the movie came out with Michael Douglas, The War of the Roses, and talk about litigation and dysfunctional, unhealthy behavior. Well, people now can say, I don't choose to go that route. I don't want to live a life of drama and high, intense insanity. I choose a more peaceable approach with dignity, kindness, and respect. Now, the other person has to be willing to do that or else it's not going to work. I'll, I'll give you a good example. Um, because I volunteer my time at the courthouse here, usually once a month, whether it's juvenile restitution or community disputes. So there was a gentleman driving from Tampa to Sarasota, and he came in late, and it was a, a civil dispute about a contractor who didn't pay the employees. To make a long story short, the two people that came who worked for the company that did the work and had not been paid by this gentleman had their attorney present. This guy walked in with an attitude like, I'm not going to be here. Uh, I, I don't know anything, anything. Everything is all in my wife's name. So you can take me to court, and I'm leaving. And that was it. You couldn't mediate that case. Okay, I get it. So so thank you. That's pretty clear. Well, th- Derry, I want to thank you for being our featured guest today. It was a pleasure, and I thank you for the opportunity. Yes, thank you. And I, I know that our audience uh, gained a great deal of value from what you had to share uh, right. If they need to get in touch with me, I can give you my website. Uh, it's just three W's and a dot, and it's D-R for doctor, and then dairy, no period after the R, D like David, E-R-I dot com. And there's a place on there to send an email or phone number, et cetera. Okay, wonderful. So listeners, if you'd like to get in touch with Dr. Derry to contact her or to learn more about her services, go to www.dairy.com. D R D E R I dot com. That's Dr. Derry dot com. Derry, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. And I, I do want to say a point that I enjoyed was when you talked about taking care of yourself, that reminder mm-hmm. to do something physical. You know, Bob and I have found in our work remembering to take care of your body is a big part of Absolutely. And go for massages. <laughs> Very good. Or go get in the hot tub. <laughs> That sounds wonderful. Thank you, Derry. <laughs> Thank you, great, you so Derry, much. That, that, that I'll be looking for the Epsom salt uh, when we get off the call. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, Derry, what final thoughts or key idea would you like our audience to take away from today's broadcast? 
Well, I'll, I'll share one of my favorite quotes from Gandhi, which is, be the change you wish to see in the world. Excellent, Derry. Well, thank you so much for being our featured guest today, and I want to thank our listeners for listening. For Christine Wright, this is Dr. Robert Wright, Jr. of www.stressfreenow.info. Until next time, be safe and be well.